Good morning. This is Emily Freitag with Instruction Partners, and I'm very pleased to be speaking today with Uri Treisman, who is the director of the Dana Center um, and um, a, an admired mathematician and someone who's taught me a lot about mathematics over the years and grateful to be talking to you about how we rethink intervention and what we know to be true about what works and what doesn't in supporting student learning um, today with a focus on mathematics. Um, thank you so much, Uri, for being part of this conversation. And thank you so much for trying to get that R right. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, a privilege to be part of this series with such wonderful speakers. I enjoyed them so much, those interviews. Thank you. Thank you for um, adding to our wisdom collectively. So as we are with all of these interviews, just want to start in a personal place. Um, tell us about your own journey as a learner and what that has taught you about learning. Well, gee, there are so many different stories. There's a scene in Zorba the Greek where the Englishman meets him on the beach and says, what is your name? And Zorba says, I have many names if you are interested. <laughs> <laughs> there are many stories, so I thought about which one would be most helpful. So I have not been so fortunate to beget my own offspring. So I've never had my own biological children. But 35 years ago, working with the courts on homelessness and foster care, I met two exquisite 14-year-olds, an African-American young man and a dark-skinned Latina, and became legally responsible for them. So I became a parent of 14-year-olds. And they came to Berkeley, and they had not really been in school for a while. But the idea was they were going to be surrounded by my Berkeley African-American and Latino road scholars and engineers. Perfect environment. So new parent. Mm. They have to sign their schedule. And it says career math. And I say algebra. So the school says career math. Mm. Well, I say I'm a new parent. I apologize. Can you please tell me which careers you're preparing them for? And the note comes back saying, they're not going into algebra. This is Berkeley High School. They're not going into algebra. They're not ready. They failed the placement test. They don't have the background. You'll have to come in. So these are kids who have that veneer of urban fierceness, corn road hair, that mm -hmm. sort of scowl. You scratch them, they cry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I walk in with my arms around both of them, and the counselor, African-American woman, looks up and says, oh, sir, I'm so sorry. I'll put them right into algebra without me saying anything. And I had this rage, completely disoriented. And it took me, what it took me to get those kids what they needed in a school system that was about equity mm -hmm. was so much more than I could have ever imagined. Mm -hmm especially given that the people I knew in that system cared as deeply as I did about the children and their goals. Mm -hmm. And it taught me, which is not easy for me, a certain kind of humility, mm -hmm. that the complexity of these systems needs to be honored and that the people in them know a lot more than we do about the everyday practices. As someone once said, they uh, know more than they can articulate and often we can articulate more than we know. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. in so that was a lesson for me. It forced me to recognize that even the best intentions, my ability to call the mayor when I was unhappy or the school superintendent, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to pick their teachers, it took enormous amounts of energy to mm -hmm. compensate for four years of non-involvement. Mm -hmm. so and you had so much privilege that you were able to bring to that that is um, not, not true all the time. I had already 15 PhD students who studied learning and flying yeah. scale. Mm -hmm. Revere Deborah Ball, we learned everything we could from her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet mm -hmm. doing it in the context of the real world was so much harder than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, can, you, can I ask? how these esteemed students are doing today. Yes. So um, Julia did graduate from UC Santa Cruz. And when she graduated, uh, I told her if she graduated, I would give her any gift that I, she wanted that I could possibly imagine. 
and she said to me, I want to be in a place where people do not think they know who I am when they look at me. Hmm. She picked Norway. Hmm. Why? I don't know. She went and she never came back. Hmm. She's a health practitioner in rural Norway. Hmm. And Sean is an insurance salesman. He graduated from college. And this would not have been possible without the fact that I have exquisite friends, privilege, and the help of people who really knew how to parent. Mm -hmm. And an extremely good therapist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Both for me and them. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Um, so I take away from that story just how much you personally learned about the how much is baked into the system that we don't account for in some of the theory and how practical um, understanding of that and recognition of that needs to go into how we think about change. Is that the right takeaway or, or correct if there's that more? Stage in my career, I mostly thought about intervention mm -hmm. as filling in holes, Mm -hmm. Building stronger infrastructure. And of course, there are some children who just had the flu that week when the teacher came mm -hmm. in and didn't bother. Mm -hmm. And schools would be irresponsible to put them in complex programs without careful assessment. Mm -hmm. There are some students who can be uh, brought up to or ahead of grade level with minimal responsible professional advising intervention and so forth. Mm -hmm but it's fewer students than I would have imagined. Mm -hmm. When I work in middle schools or I work in community colleges, in middle school algebra, eighth grade algebra, mm -hmm. uh, it's very typical that a quarter or a third of the students are four years behind mm -hmm. using standard you know, instruments. So the idea that helping them catch up, which we are morally obligated to do, and must do is easy or can be mm -hmm. done with a simple theory. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. doesn't uh, comport with my experience. Mm -hmm. There is nothing simple about educating people. Mm -hmm. right. And the first thing, if I were to frame the lesson, is that you know I've now had 108 doctoral students. Mm -hmm. I know a lot about um, the intricacies of mastering content, consolidating knowledge. But if the students aren't there, and don't have the wherewithal <laughs> mm -hmm. to actually learn, um, my sophisticated knowledge is not as helpful as mm -hmm. I would like it to be. Mm -hmm. like it to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's especially true today. Um, there are two things going on today that we in the world, we who are privileged to support schools and support teachers and families, um, the first is that more kids are going to have difficulty being in school mm -hmm. because of the devastating wipeout of the last 10 years of gains of the poorest part of the population. It was 40% of the families and the $40,000 experienced job loss. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing this in my students online. You could just mm -hmm. see the radical disruption. Mm -hmm. This is not the time to say there are no excuses. Mm -hmm. This is the time to figure out what kids need mm -hmm. and make sure our theories don't come before grounded experience and the reality. Of yes, yeah. Uh, the second thing, and this is much more subtle, that the strategies we use for equity um, 10 years ago, or six years ago, 20 years ago, were strategies that focused on hope and the future. They worked when there was upward mobility. In my work with master teachers in 10 districts, seven of the groups noticed that the strategies weren't working when kids were downwardly mobile. Mm. They say, look, my dad went to community college, he's unemployed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We in intervention, we need to have our pulse on the lives of the families we mm -hmm. want to support. If they're downwardly mobile, 
we need to tweak and use different strategies for making sure they're there than in periods where Martin Luther King and Obama, not to forget the importance of that, the positive too. Mm -hmm. If we don't recognize students' reality, they will not trust us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And without that, we can't teach. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is a great point. Um, both the, it, it requires us to both look at the assumptions underneath our strategies mm -hmm. and take action to ensure that we understand our students. Um, and both of those feel so important. Thank you. Um, so let us zoom out to just understand what we know to be true. Um, I think uh, I was telling you, I think this is a very confusing time and it's an important time to then anchor back to what we do know. Um, so from your research and experience, what, what can we hold on to as true? Well, one of the things that should have been obvious, but it took a lot of hard earned experience to learn, is that you can help kids catch up by slowing them down. You can or you, you cannot. Can. You yeah. cannot. You cannot. It doesn't mean that you don't go backward on a particular day. Mm -hmm. This is not like, you know, you know, Ed reports, Jason Zimba, where you're not allowed to go back even one minute or you commit <laughs> some sin against children. Uh -huh. The fact is that you have to go back selectively, but in the context of keeping kids moving forward and getting them to grade level. That has very much been a theme across all of our conversations, particularly in mathematics. So let's just say that again you can go back and you have to go back, but you should do it in the context of getting them to grade level. But there's something more subtle, which you don't see in the, uh, most of the curriculum out there. Mm -hmm. And that is looking forward. Mm -hmm. You work with students who've been denied opportunity. They really don't know even the names of the courses that come next. Mm. So if you don't want students to be led like sheep on a death march to the quadratic formula. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and one of the abuses of the last piece of standards movement was seeing so focused on grade level that curricula which foreshadowed what's coming next. It's like in our approach, every topic kids see what it's going to look like in two years, in three mm -hmm. years, when they're in the workforce. Mm -hmm. We have to, you know, not be so wedded to absolutes that we don't think about the development of children, their understanding of why, not only what they're doing, how to do it, but why they're doing it. And this connects with their belief that effort into improvement will matter and that they are building a life that they know something about. Those things, if that's separate from the math, neither will work. I love that. Thank you. I, we're going to pull that quote out and bold it. Um, there's so much there about, and it's, so, it's been so resonant across all these conversations, just how much we have to keep it in context, not be wedded to absolutes, connect to the why, give students agency in, the, in their own learning. Um, so much about that was very powerful to me. Um, another thing that took us a while to learn, you know, it's funny, now when you look back, you go, how did I not see that? <laughs> <laughs> when I have my calculus students and they're feeling insecure, I give them a copy of their ninth grade algebra book and I remind them of the struggles. And when they look at it now, they can't imagine how it took more than two weeks to learn that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to do that with ourselves. We had beliefs that we had at the school. Mm -hmm. Early on, we focused a lot on individual teachers 
when I was on the TNTP board, right, and the boards mm -hmm. of many of the organizations mm -hmm. that came to yours, there was a period where we focused on the teacher and the principal as instructional lead. We told principals to spend lots of times in classrooms. That's mm -hmm. really a big mistake, as every researcher has largely shown. It's their job to coordinate and manage instruction, not necessarily to be the coach in every classroom. And we didn't understand how difficult it was for young teachers to teach. Because we never solved the problem of whose kids get which teacher. Mm. So the importance of coherent school norms, the kind of common practices that make it possible for less experienced teachers, who are the teachers the poorest children get, mm -hmm. to learn and be effective. We didn't, we found like some amazing, there are some teachers that are so good they can make bad ideas work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are only a handful. Mm -hmm. Most regular talented mortals need to be in an environment that reinforces the messages they give to kids. Mm -hmm. Kids who are struggling cannot uh, thrive when every classroom they're in has a different set of principles, norms, and values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a more dimensional problem than one or two. Mm -hmm. Very interesting to think about in the context, particularly of, you know, staffing models that may be very complicated for the coming years. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the politics of staffing in districts. Yeah, yeah. Um, take us into what we know does not work. What are things that you see schools try and what are things that maybe you thought would work and your research over time has found does not? So first, at sort of a meta level. Meta level is always easier. Mm -hmm. It's like when I'm not, in the rare semester I'm not teaching, education reform seems a lot easier. <laughs> So what does it work? Well, as I said, slowing students down, remediation. You know, I started as a groundsman on the community college campus, a gardener, mm -hmm. six years, grounds and maintenance. The first lesson was you don't build structures on weak foundations. Programs that are remedial, uh, and technically oriented, do not, cannot really work in environments that are focused on excellence and moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's not to say you don't have to attend to students' learning needs. Mm -hmm. but when you look at the programs in remediation, community college, it seems like the rhetoric is all focused around some deficiencies, retention, like a kidney ailment. The whole language <laughs> when mm -hmm. you're of remediation on the thin surface looks positive, but it's all focused on students' weakness. Deficit. Mm -hmm. Unless you can practically figure out strengths, you're not going to succeed with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that takes experience. It's not something that first year teachers can do. Mm -hmm. And there are, of course, exceptions. But the typical first year teacher can't really even listen to students in a classroom without the mm -hmm. class falling apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're all back to my first year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing that we got through the first year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is. It is humbling. Um, so I think um, understanding what's really required, what the strengths of students are, and practical strategies for constructing environments in which those kids can thrive. Before you can get to like an on track, on time model, mm -hmm. we're working on in, we're working on in New York, Chicago, these models, mm -hmm. you have to, have to ensure that people see the strengths of students, have a theory of that development that works, uh, I think we've learned on the what works that you need to have relational trust in the schools. Mm -hmm. yeah, even the best ideas don't work in an environment where people don't respect each other or their principal. 
And that's not just practical knowledge of somebody. That's what research shows. Tony mm -hmm. Barbara Schneider. Mm -hmm. So when we in the world of technical support and advice, uh, we have to recognize that. Yeah. The whole theory of learning or cognitive science or neuropsychology is not yeah. going to do it. The second thing yeah. is while there is deep research knowledge about motivation, for example, um, it really is only a small piece of learning. Like, let's take Carol Dweck's exquisitely beautiful work. Mm -hmm. So districts, it became popular. Mm -hmm. It's crazy not to use it. It's beautiful work. Mm -hmm. But it's not a replacement for high quality content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not worth more than seven minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What we have is organizations that this is deep neo-institutional theory. Reform organizations need to be trending. They need to be aware and to be doing one of everything. Mm -hmm. Exactly what they counsel principles not to do. Mm -hmm. So we have to be cautious about new theory. New theory almost never works as we hope because it's not embedded in the fiber of everyday life. Not to use that stuff is also crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we need a balanced view, less to look at it. So example, uh, the Stanford folks went out and gave assemblies on capability mindsets in Boston. We did walkthroughs three weeks later. And you have all these kids saying, you know, I tried really hard. I must be really dumb because it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. We had teachers saying, that kid has the wrong mindset. There's nothing I can do. Now, Carol was horrified, and she immediately wrote beautiful, clarifying editorials. Mm -hmm. But the pressure to do the trending, to reduce complex things to seven principles mm -hmm. that brand us is so great. We have to resist it. I think that is so relevant, especially in a crisis. I mean, I, I think the, the urge for the three point plan right now is very yeah. intense. Um, and also I think this idea of, um, I don't know if this is a spin on trendy, but like, because we're in a crisis, we need to do something new. I, mm -hmm. I do think people are feeling some of that. And what I'm hearing from you is um, don't oversimplify and don't, just over implement something new think about it carefully in the context of what you know and what is already a part of your fabric so two things most of my superintendent colleagues are now trying to create stability and predictability mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're focused on truancy they're not focused on the idiosyncrasies and fine points of constructivist or direct instruction. Right. Mm -hmm. Where are the kids? How do, yeah. we, how do we relate to the community? How do we find and relate to the community part partners mm -hmm. when that used to be nice, but is now necessary? Super essential. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Move yeah. from nice to necessary. Mm -hmm. They're working on really hard. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to help them support we're also trying to figure out this, you know, well, this is true, I'll just say it. They're trying to figure, put aside their press releases and trying to figure out what they're actually good at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a moment like this, you have to actually know what you can pull off. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's not always the same as what superintendents and leaders will tell you because what they tell you is, what, is related to how they get their legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. superintendents get a legitimacy from the Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. That's good if it's fine, if they're supported to do it. Some get that legitimacy from the communities they serve. And if, when you're a principal in the district, you need to figure out where does your power come from? Mm -hmm. What can you actually pull off? in ways that create calm, that create a buffer that allow people to do teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. 
That's where um, we're trying to help people do. Yeah. Well, I've also been just so struck by across these conversations, um, kind of the reminder of why we all got into this profession in the first place and how relevant those original motives are to this mm -hmm. moment. Um, and I think we all got into this work for various reasons, but it had to do with the complexity of human interaction mm -hmm. around teaching and learning, not the simplification of it. Um, so any final thoughts for us on what we should be thinking about our learning as we prepare to support students in the coming year? I'm going to respond to your last comment, something I deeply care about. If I think of, I've had 108 graduate students, mm -hmm. more than half of them came from TFA. Mm. TFA produced a flotilla of wonderful people committed to a better world for children. What I'm seeing now is that many of those individuals no longer believe in the dream that animated them. Mm. They're asking hard questions about were the theories they went into schools with adequate to the task. Mm -hmm. We must re-engage that community. Mm. Mm. We, you see healthy challenge in that world a new generation challenging the orthodoxy of mm -hmm. <laughs> the old ones. Power to you. Mm -hmm. if, the, if those individuals lose faith, it will be devastating mm -hmm. for education reform going forward. And that is more important than the idiosyncrasies or particulars of, it, of instructional theory. Mm -hmm. The thing that's more important is the, the commitment to the possibility. Yes. The commitment and, to and hope. To learn and to mine, to capture, to use what we have learned and not to let our disappointments and our previous failures pull us away from a dream that was right. Mm. Oh, that's very interesting to think about. I, I am a Teach for America alum myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I actually found, particularly in our work in Tennessee, um, I became more of an optimist about the dream and more of a believer that it is possible. Um, also more humble about what it takes, no doubt. But, um, I do think this is just such a moment for us to really come back to the fundamentals and come back to the dream. Um, it is a reinvention of our country in so many ways right now. And therefore we need to be very clear on what the dream is that we are pursuing. I'll say one last thought that we're in a period of enormous polarization. Mm -hmm. We're in a period where people systematically seek out narrow areas of disagreement and broaden them into tribal conflict. Our job in civic work, your job in civic work, is to find narrow areas of agreement mm -hmm. and build them into platforms for a world that is worthy of our children and ourselves. Oh, thank you for ending on that note. I do think that is what we are trying to do in these series of conversations and grateful for your participation in the discussion. Thank strength, you, Uri. Strength and courage. <laughs> thank you very much. Take care.